We are in Baker, California. This is the world's tallest thermometer, Tent 134 gift shop. And the highest I've seen is 132 degrees C. No, nah, you just get used to it like any other place. Yeah, because when I, I grew up here and then I got used to the heat and then I moved up north. I got used to the cold, I came back down, it took about a couple months to get used to the heat again. The past few years, the temperatures fluctuated. It's gotten a lot drier, less rain, stuff like that. What do you like better, hot or cold? I prefer the heat. We are in uh, the southern part of Orange County, California, in a canyon called Aliso Woods Canyon. This is a fire that we had pretty early on in the season. Yeah, if you look across the canyon up on the other slope, uh, the fire started there. And what we had on that day on May 11th was a very strong onshore wind. And so when you combine the onshore winds, the fuel loading, because there's no fire history in this area, and then look at the topography behind me on how steep these canyons are. You had the fuel, the wind, and topography, and those are the three elements that drive fire. We started in heli logging in the 80s, mid 80s, when we bought our first helicopter. And you know, falling trees, you know, there's a lot of sparks and a lot of heat generated. And so when it got hot and the fire danger increased, we couldn't log anymore. So we had our helicopter sitting there. And then we decided as a family that firefighting was, was really a better fit for us. It's, it's unique where we are in Southern California. It's, it's what we call the kind of the Super Bowl of firefighting. It's got the highest population, you know, in the U.S. and generally the, the worst wildfire seasons that we'll see across the U.S. Population is obviously growing, you know, year by year, especially in, in California and the Western states. And as that grows, it just pushes communities further and further up into the wildland fire environment. And the two typically don't go very well together. You know, fire and people is a combination that we, we, we that's, that's our business, right? We try to keep, keep the two away. When I got started, you know, 20 years ago, we had a well-defined fire season. Uh, nowadays, it's, it's year round. I've been many years between Texas and just the Western states where I fought fire for 12 months, nonstop. I came up through the ranks. I, I, I worked on a fire engine as far as actually pulling hose and putting out fires. Aircraft, they give you a vantage point that you don't have on the ground. And uh, I think it's very reassuring to know that there's going to be a reconnaissance aircraft there looking out for you. And there's going to be a lot of water showing up very quickly. We took uh, all the lessons learned from all the tanking systems and firefighting aircraft you know, over the last 30 years 
and designed one of the best fire tank systems, put in the largest firefighting helicopter the world's ever seen. This was a step up for me, and, and I'm a fairly new co-pilot in this helicopter. What stands out for me is the massive power that this aircraft has, and the ability to take more water than anybody else. So we're not really designed to be doing command and control. We're, we're the heavy hitter. Yeah, this is the first time that a heavy tanker is being used for initial attack. Usually they have the smaller helicopters come in, they size up the fire. And because the fires are becoming more aggressive, and harder to control. We're trying to get, you know, up to 7,000 gallons of water on the first pass. Those firefighters that are putting in hose lays, the dozers, all that is in concert. And so the helicopters will drop just in front to try to knock down the fire, cool it for those guys to, and gals to get close. You know, that first hour is make it or break it time. Uh, the reaction time is getting us anywhere in the counties within, you know, 15, 20 minutes after notification. That's where the quick comes from, a quick reaction force. And then the force is having the ability to have these three heavy lift heli tankers here in the region already, 24 hour a day, seven days a week. On May 11th, we didn't have the program staffed. QRF didn't come on until July 1st. If we did have those assets, it would have been a huge benefit. Here in Wrightwood, uh, California, just about 45 minutes to an hour north of downtown Los Angeles. It's definitely not the suburban jungle. You guys see it on your drive up, but you'll see signs that say entering wildfire area. So it definitely changes the, um, the readiness as far as what you're doing to prepare uh, in regards to, I see the smoke, it's less than a mile from my home. When you want to live here and have a home here, that's just part of the contract, really, is who knows what all the real factors are in regards to, uh, you know, why Southern California has the type of weather it has, you know, but, um, you know, knowing that we're in a drought and um, we're mindful about our water usage, um, and that's, I mean, really the best we can do as far as on an individual level. What I think can be done about it, I mean, I think that's a big project that needs a lot of minds on it to really come together and come up with some solutions for that. You know, as we're talking about drought, the rivers are shallower, the lakes are shallower. So that pushes us into the golf course environment, especially in Southern California. We do a lot of golf course uh, reservoirs. We'll, we'll go there and draft water. The temperatures are getting warmer. I mean, you never know, right? There's, you know, global warming or just general, um, you know, environment changes. 
uh, it's undisputable that it's getting hotter. The population is growing more, and so we're seeing more and more people growing out and moving into the wilderness and moving out into the bush, which means fires that maybe you used to be able to just let burn naturally. You can't do that anymore because there's lives and property at risk. So every year we have these mega fires that continue to get worse and worse. The last two years have been California. This year, France has been burning. So, you know, we see it as a cyclic event that's happening annually now. There's no more fire season. It's turning into a fire year. And so when we look at that, we say, well, you're getting bigger and bigger fires. The fires are getting more and more intense. And so the aircraft needed to fight them are going to need to be larger, faster, more capable. And you know, we look at what used to be a big helicopter 20 years ago. Now, those are the entry level that you would expect when you get to a fire. The fire service, it, it's this institution that's been around, you know, since Benjamin Franklin, a couple hundred years. And it gets stuck in this culture of, hey, we've always done it this way. Why would we change now? We can't keep doing it the way we've been doing it. It's not working. We're losing too many homes. People are dying. We have to come up with a different system. And here we are. The quick reaction force is what we have now, this QRF is supposed to be part of that change. I don't think this is the end game, what we're doing. I think this is just the start of changing on how we do firefighting. The, the models cannot keep up with the inputs that we're putting into them. They're unable to basically fathom the conditions that we find ourselves in. Uh, so that opens up a, a whole nother, you know, side of, of trying to mitigate these these fires is we don't know what we need. We don't know how big it's going to get. So, so uh, having more aircraft is something we see uh, progressing down the road. Every year we see more and more aircraft come online. Um, you know, the bigger the fire it is, the more resources it takes. It takes more aircraft, it takes more ground firefighters, it takes more fire trucks, it takes more water trucks, it takes more bulldozers, it takes more hotshot crews. But just because we may be at the tip of the spear today, it may not be good enough tomorrow. <laughs>